Okay, so before we start with uh, chapter two, uh, I just want to talk for a, a, a few minutes about Cheteris Paribus. The principle of Cheteris Paribus, which is spelled like this, uh, obviously it comes from Latin, and the principle of Cheteris Paribus basically says all else stays constant. And we could not have an economics class without this uh, Cheteris Paribus running in the background. Because basically in economics, what we're saying is, well, what if we change something? What if we change a variable? What is gonna be the impact on employment, on GDP, on whatever? So you change X, what is the impact on Y? Uh, the problem is, uh, y is not a function, let's say the GDP is not a function of just one thing, but it's a function of many things, okay? So y, for example, is a function of x1, x2, x3, xn, of many, many variables. So. Uh, what we're trying to do is to find out, well, if we change X3, what is going to be the impact on Y? Uh, but the only way that we can uh, figure out what a change in X3 will do to Y is if you are able to force X1, X2, X4, Xn to stay the same, not to change. Everything stays the same except one variable changes and then you can tell uh, what is going to be the impact on Y. Uh, in real life, we don't have this type of a situation. In real life, what happens is uh, one thing changes, but other things are changing at the same time. So you don't know what's going to happen to Y. So that's why I'm saying that we could not have this class if not for Cheteris Paribus, because whatever question I would ask you, you could say, I don't know, and that would be the correct answer. Well, if interest rates go up, what's gonna happen? I don't know. If this changes, if the prices go up, what's gonna change? I don't know, because other things will be changing at the same time. So, uh, Cheteris Paribus allows us to have a conversation uh, about economics, but also at the same time, uh, in the real life, Cheris Paribus does not apply. That's, that's why economics is not an exact science, is more art than science. Uh, a policy that works fantastic this time, uh, another time may be an abject failure. So, so how come this works this time, but it doesn't work the other time? Because things have changed, variables have changed. You cannot control them, you cannot say everything else stays constant. So uh, this is one of the problems that we have with economics in real life. In real life, you cannot say, oh, uh, I'm going to change this, but everything else has to stay the same. Uh, people have to have the same opinions. They have to have the same outlook. You know, Well, a policy, when people feel good about it, uh, may work. And if they feel pessimistic about it, it may not work. So it, it depends. Things change. So uh, in theory, we can certainly apply Cheteris Paribus and it allows us to talk about economics in real life. That's not the case. Okay, very important concept, but you're not gonna be tested on this. Okay, now <clears throat> let's uh, start with chapter two with, with the basics. So with chapter two, we're talking about, well, how come we study economics? So why economics? And the reason is twofold. One is because we have unlimited wants And you couple unlimited ones with the fact that we have limited resources. So 
In other words, we want everything, but we cannot have everything. We cannot produce an infinite number of goods. We can only produce a finite number of goods, but since we want everything, well, we're gonna have to make choices. This situation where we have unlimited wants coupled with limited resources, this leads to scarcity. So I'm gonna go in a second and I'm gonna talk about scarcity. But I just wanna mention, before I talk about scarcity, I wanna mention what those limited resources are in economics. And those limited resources are land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Uh, we can leave entrepreneurship aside because it's kind of hard to define entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship may be uh, management skills, willingness to take risk. Uh, so it's hard to measure. Uh, those, the other ones uh, we can measure to a certain extent, land, is measurable and there's so much land that we have. Labor, there's so, so much labor that we have. And capital, capital, by the way, is not money in economics. In economics, we refer to capital more like tools. Uh, so a tractor, a computer is a unit of capital, but not money. Money would be more like financial capital, but uh, it, those are tools. So we have only so many tools so much labor, so much land, therefore we can only produce so much. So this fact, the fact that we have unlimited wants coupled with limited resources, this leads to something called scarcity. Well, what is the scarcity? Well, there's not enough for everybody. So we're gonna have to make choices. Now, uh, Next chapter, we're going to talk about something that kind of reminds us of scarcity, but it's not going to be called scarcity and is different from scarcity. We, we may have from time to time a situation where quantity demanded is greater than quantity supplied. And when we have that quantity demanded is greater than quantity supplied, what we're gonna have is a case of a shortage. But shortage is gonna be different from scarcity in that scarcity is something that is permanent with us. Shortages come and go, but scarcity is forever. So we will ever have scarcity because we want everything, but we cannot have everything. Shortages, they happen for a short period of time because the price of a product happens to be below equilibrium price, and therefore quantity demanded is going to be greater than quantity supplied. Okay, so moving on, let's take, take a look at what the scarcity leads us to. So here we have scarcity. We cannot have everything for everybody. That means that we're gonna have to make choices. And by the way, I, I don't want you to think that economists make choices. Economists do not make the choices. Economists are the people who are presenting the choices. Uh, somebody else who's in charge is gonna make the choices. Uh, Congress is gonna make the choices. CEOs are gonna make the choices. Economists are the people who are saying, well, on one hand, you have this. On the other hand, you have that. And on the other hand, you have... Uh, so they present all the possible... Well, not all the possible, because you cannot present all the possible choices, but they present as many choices as possible. So the person in charge, the person who's gonna make the choice, they, they will make as much as an, of an informed decision uh, choice as they can, okay? So this leads us to a new term called opportunity cost because opportunity cost is about making choices. <clears throat> and 
And now I understand this in a classroom would not work like this because I would ask the you know people in the classroom to tell me what is their opportunity cost for being here with me today at this time in this classroom, okay? And somebody may say something like, well, I could be sleeping. Somebody may say, I could be making money, working and therefore making money. Somebody may say, oh, I don't know, I could be watching TV. Uh, spend time with family. Uh, all kinds of stuff. So obviously, what opportunity cost is what you are giving up for doing an action, for pursuing a certain action. You are here with me talking about economics. That means that you cannot be watching TV. That means that you cannot be sleeping and, and so on and so forth. So which one is it? Which one is the opportunity cost? And the answer is, it's the one thing that you value the most because that's what you would have done if not for being in this classroom. So the one thing that you value the most and yet you gave it up in order to pursue an action, to be in this classroom with me. And obviously opportunity cost is gonna be different from person to person. Somebody who's very, very tired, their opportunity cost is probably sleeping. Somebody who uh, is missing their favorite uh, show is gonna be watching TV and, and so on. So we all have different opportunity costs, even though we're doing exactly the same thing. We're, we're watching each other and talking about economics or, or actually more like watching me talk about economics. Uh, you know, we all have different opportunity costs. We're doing the same thing, but we have different opportunity costs. So that's why on a test, you, you may see a question that goes something like this. Uh, Jack and Jill are given ticket, uh, tickets to see the same movie, uh, whatever the movie is and they go together to see the movie. Uh, do they have the same opportunity cost since they went to see the same movie? And the answer is no, because they probably gave up different things. So it's what you are giving up. If you do this, you cannot do that. If you study for economics, you cannot study for English and, and, and so on. So we all have opportunity costs. We have opportunity costs. A country has opportunity costs. Companies have opportunity costs. Everybody has opportunity costs. If you do one thing, you cannot do something else. Okay. So let's apply this opportunity cost at a level of a country. So let's say that here we're looking at the US. And I'm going to take a look at the opportunity cost of uh, the US producing two goods. How come two goods? Because I cannot draw in millions and millions of dimensions, but I can draw in two dimensions fairly well. So the two goods that we are producing are oranges or wheat. So I'm gonna plot here on a graph. Here is oranges. And on the X axis, I'm gonna put wheat. Okay, now the next question is, uh, if we produce the maximum maximorum amount of oranges, the maximum that can be produced in the country, in the US we're producing oranges, the maximum oranges, how much wheat are we producing? And the answer is zero, because all the resources are dedicated to the production of oranges. That's when you produce the maximum oranges, when all the resources are dedicated to oranges. So we're gonna have absolutely no wheat. It's gonna, wheat is gonna be here at zero, and there's gonna be some quantity for oranges, whatever the maximum that is, okay? So this is the maximum oranges. Let's denote it as O. And I can say the same thing about, well, what is the maximum amount of wheat that we can produce? And the maximum amount of wheat is gonna be the wheat where we produce absolutely no oranges. So we're gonna have oranges down to zero, and then we're gonna have some quantity of wheat, whatever that quantity is. Okay. 
because there's a limit to how much we can produce. There's a limit to the resources. All right, now, <clears throat> we don't have to be at one extreme or the other, all oranges or all wheat. We could have some resources in oranges and some resources in wheat. And folks, if I draw a line through those two maximum points, maximum oranges and maximum wheat, if I draw a line like this, that line shows me the maximum combination of wheat and oranges that we can produce. So that's the maximum maximorum combination of oranges and wheat that a country can produce. This line has a name, it's called production possibilities curve. Or PPC. For short, it's going to be PPC instead of production possibilities curve. Okay. Okay. Now, remember that when we produce on the PPC, we are producing the maximum of oranges, combination of oranges and wheat that we can, could possibly produce. So that this tells us that all the resources are being utilized. All resources are fully employed. Because if we had some unemployed resources, we could put those resources to work and then produce even more. But we're already producing the maximum. So this implies that all resources, land, labor, capital, all are fully employed. Okay. So it, we are efficient when we produce on the PPC. So any point on the PPC where it's this point, or this point, or this point, or this point, it doesn't matter, any point on the PPC, that's efficient. Now, <clears throat> could we possibly produce less than the maximum? And the answer is, of course we can produce less than the maximum. We have some resources that are not employed, some people who are not working, some land that is not being utilized, some capital that is not being utilized. So certainly we can produce inside of the PPC. So anything to the left, it is possible, but it's also not efficient. So therefore it's gonna be inefficient, right? You're not producing the maximum that you are producing, that means you are inefficient. <clears throat> what about a combination of wheat and oranges that lies to the right of the PPC? Like a point here or over here. Those are not attainable at this time. We just don't have the resources to produce those combinations here. Anything, anything that is to the right of the PPC, we just don't have the resources to produce over there. So not attainable at this time. Might they become attainable in the future? Of course, as the economy grows, as we gain more resources, this PPC is gonna shift to the right and then eventually those points will be part of the PPC. Okay. So uh, this one I'm gonna, uh, well, you can write up, I don't have space over here, but it, they are, those points here are unattainable at this present time. Okay. So efficient, inefficient, unattainable, impossible right now. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Now, uh, the book actually th th gives a, an interesting um, explanation be for the difference between being efficient and inefficient. And the way the book explains efficient versus inefficient, it says like this, uh, when we pr are producing efficiently, if we wanna gain more of one good we will necessarily have to give up from the other one. 
So efficient, you want more of wheat, you're gonna have to give up oranges. You want more oranges, you're gonna have, have give up some wheat. Inefficient means that I can get more wheat without necessarily losing any oranges. Well, why does that make sense? That efficient means that if you want to gain more of one, you got to give up from the other. Folks, when we operate on the PPC and we are efficient, that implies that all the resources are fully employed. Everybody is employed in the production of wheat and oranges. So everybody is working. So the only way, the only way, if I want to gain more wheat, the only way that I can get more wheat is if I go and I take some people from the production of oranges and move them into the production of wheat. So the only way I can increase the production of wheat is by decreasing the production of oranges. That's when you are efficient. When you are inefficient, guess what? Not everybody's working. There are some unemployed resources. There are some people who are not working. Can I increase the production of wheat without destroying the production of oranges? Yes. I'm going to take those people who are unemployed. I'm going to put them in, a, in the production of wheat, and I'm not going to have to lose any in the production of oranges. Okay, so let's stop for a second now and I will entertain any questions that you have. So any questions? Yeah, obviously, if you want to ask a question, you're going to have to unmute yourself and you have the capability. So, so far, so good then. Yes. Okay, that, that's what I need. I need, yeah. Okay, good. Now, when you look in the book, remember the textbook is available online. It's a PDF file. You can uh, download it and then you have it on your computer. Now, here's the thing that you're going to notice when you look in the book in chapter two. Uh, they talk about the production possibilities curve, but it's not going to look like the graph that I just showed you, but it's going to look a little bit differently. So instead of my graph, it's going to look like this. So it's going to be bowed out. Well, what's the difference? Uh, is it one correct and one incorrect? Well, they're, they're both okay. They're both okay. There's a little bit of a difference between them. And here, here's the difference. Let's take a look at my graph first. Let's suppose that we started with all oranges. And then we decide, well, let's produce one unit of wheat. Okay, well, one unit of wheat, let's say it's here. Uh, that means that we're going to have to move from this production point on the PPC uh, to approximately that production point on the PPC. Now, we are able to have one unit of wheat. Did it cost us anything? Yes, of course it did. It cost us some oranges, this many oranges. So we no longer have this amount of oranges, we have fewer oranges. Okay, so that's the opportunity cost of the first unit of wheat. However many oranges, five oranges, 10 oranges, whatever that amount. Let's suppose that we want a second unit of wheat. Okay, if I want a second unit of wheat, we're gonna have to move to that production point. When we move from this production point to this production point, now we gain the second unit of wheat, but notice that again, it cost us some oranges. How many oranges? That amount of oranges. And if I want the third unit of wheat, I'm going to have to give up this amount of oranges. What I want you to see is that the cost stays constant, stays the same. So the first unit of wheat cost me five oranges, the second five oranges, the third five oranges. So there's constant opportunity cost. 
when, when the PPC is a straight line, that means that there's a constant opportunity cost. Now, <clears throat> in the second graph, the graph that you will encounter in the textbook, uh, we don't have constant opportunity cost. So we'll do exactly the same example. Let's say we start out with all oranges here. And then we decide, well, let's get one unit of wheat. Here's a unit, here's the second one, here's the third. Well, if we want the first unit of wheat, we're going to have to move from this production point to approximately here. We got the first unit of wheat, and of course there was an opportunity cost. We lost some oranges. But this is the amount of oranges that we lost for the first unit of wheat. Let's see what is the opportunity cost for the second unit of wheat. Well, we're going to have to move to that production point. So we're moving from here to here. Now we're getting the second unit of wheat, but we lost more oranges. Is the cost the same? No. The first unit cost me two oranges. The second un unit of wheat cost me five oranges. And the third unit of wheat cost me 10 oranges. So as you can see, the opportunity cost gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So we have increasing opportunity cost. So a straight line PPC, constant opportunity cost with bowed out PPC, increasing opportunity cost. Well, like I said, uh, there is no correct answer for, well, uh, is this right or is this right? Which one of those two is right? Well, that depends on what we have on those two axes, what type of goods we have on those two axes. If the goods are very similar, then you're gonna have a constant opportunity cost. When, when the resources, land, labor, capital, when the resources are easily substitutable between the two goods, you're gonna see constant opportunity cost. If the resources are very dissimilar, they're completely different, and the resources will not be equally substitutable between the two goods, then we're going to have increasing opportunity cost. So if there was a factory that was producing either black shoes or brown shoes, I would expect constant opportunity cost. I would expect that labor is equally good between black shoes and brown shoes. The machinery is equally good between black shoes and brown shoes. But now if there's a factory that chooses to produce either shoes or nuclear missiles, I don't expect that capital, I don't expect that machinery is equally good or the workers are equally good between those two. So I would expect increasing opportunity cost. So if they are very similar, then the resources are equally substitutable and constant opportunity cost. If they are not similar, then you're gonna have increasing opportunity cost. So a factory that produces chairs or tables, constant opportunity cost. I would expect machinery is just as good or workers are just as good between uh, uh, tables and chairs, okay? Uh, but a factory that produces either furniture or uh, automobiles. No, I, I would not expect uh, constant opportunity cost, but increasing opportunity cost. Questions so far? Uh, yeah, yeah, I have one. So if yeah. something is bowed out, right, as it's, and it's and basically exponentially increasing the opportunity cost, would that eventually level out? As they, like, if they, they're shoe smiths and then they start uh, making nuclear missiles as the workers become more skilled at making nuclear missiles would that would that increasing opportunity cost level out if, if the workers become better and better yeah that then you would see a flattening yeah okay okay thank you
Mm -hmm. But in the short run, I would not expect that to happen. In the long run, yeah, could, it could happen. Okay, very good. Uh, now, let's talk a little bit about this PPC because uh, PPC really doesn't help us very much uh, in, in, in the real world. In, uh, uh, we only talk about PPC maybe in chapter two and then when we talk about trade. Uh, the last chapter of the class is gonna be about international trade. And uh, what's gonna happen, what's nice about uh, international trade is that uh, you're gonna see something very interesting. Uh, folks, uh, it doesn't matter whether we look at the PPC boat out or straight line, uh, we know that any point that lies outside of the PPC is unattainable. We don't have the resources for it. Uh, well, guess what? Uh, at the end of the semester, when we talk about trade, we're going to see that trade will actually allow us to consume outside of the PPC. We're still going to be producing on the PPC because we still have the same resources, we, we, whether we trade or we do not trade. So we're still going to be producing on the PPC, but it's going to allow us to consume outside of the PPC. So it's going to be quite interesting. And, and I'll prove it to you with actual numbers, not just talking about it. Okay. Now, what are some of the limitations of this PPC? Well, let's say that we're looking at the PPC of different countries. And we're looking at the PPC of the United States versus Romania. Well, and I'm going to draw it as a straight line. It doesn't matter. Here's the US. Well, where would Romania be? And obviously the answer would be Romania would be someplace inside, would be exactly. You're absolutely right, to the left. So here's Romania. Uh, why? Because Romania has fewer resources, less land, labor, capital, and so on. Okay. So, but let's compare US to Switzerland. Uh, the, any idea what is the symbol for Switzerland? If US is USA, Switzerland is going to be anybody? CH, that stands for Switzerland. Um, well, when we compare ourselves to Switzerland, we would say, wow, look at the US, we produce a lot more. Look at Switzerland, they produce a lot less. Great in the US, not so great in Switzerland. No, that, that would not be fair. It would be completely unfair to compare the PPC of the United States with the PPC of Switzerland. Because basically, what, when, when we're saying the PPC, and we're gonna, in chapter eight, we're gonna learn about GDP. It's like saying, this is the GDP of the US, and this is the GDP of Switzerland. This is, if you will, the national income of the US and here's national income of Switzerland. So their income is a lot smaller than our income. But it's not unfair to compare ourselves in those terms. Why? Because they have a lot fewer people. So we would have to compare not the GDP or not the national income of the US to the national income of Switzerland, but what is the income per person in the US and what is the income per person in Switzerland. And if you would look at income per person in the US and in Switzerland, what you would observe is that it's actually higher in Switzerland than in the US. Okay. There, there's an interesting, and here I'm not going to show it to you because it's a pain, but there's an interesting uh, um, table uh, in, if you Google per capita income or per capita GDP, and make sure that when you compare per capita income or GDP, you pick the one that has in parentheses is PPP. That means purchasing power parity, okay? Because only those numbers that are comparing the per capita income with purchasing power parity matter. 
And you will see that a country such as LUX stands for Luxembourg, tiny, tiny country. Their, their per capita income is close to $100,000. Here in the US is something like 55. Uh, and you cannot say, you cannot say, oh yeah, but uh, in Luxembourg, everything is expensive. Uh-uh, you can't say that because purchasing power parity has already been taken in account, into account. It's, it's as if the people in Switzerland, they're making $100,000 here in the U.S. So it's, they're buying the equivalent of $100,000 here in the U.S. While in the U.S., a U.S. Is person, the, the per capita is $500,000 also in the U.S. So there are no differences in prices. Uh, interestingly enough, so you can understand also this purchasing power parity. Um, uh, I don't, I ha probably haven't told you, I would have told you this, if we were classroom, but I always travel, every year I travel once or twice to Romania. And I love to travel to Romania, well, not only because I came from over there, but everything is so cheap. Very, very cheap. Well, guess what? Let's think about this purchasing power parity. Um, <clears throat> if, if, when you look at that table, if you were to open up uh, uh, Google and do per, per capita GDP, and you look at the table, and you look at the US, and then you look at Romania, and you go down to Romania, and Romania, uh, their per capita income is like about 28,000 bucks. Okay. Uh, well, their per capita income is $28,000, but if you go over there in Romania, and you look at the average income of a person, and the average income is obviously is not going to be in dollars, but it's going to be in Romanian currency, RAN or LEI. Uh, there, and you take that, that average income and using the exchange rates, you convert it into dollars. Well, how much does it come to? Well, it's going to come to about six or $7,000. Well, but if they make $7,000 in Romania, uh, given the exchange rates, why are they saying that per capita income is $28,000? Because those $7,000 in Romania are buying the equivalent of somebody making $28,000 here. So uh, with PPP, you are taking into account differences in prices. So that's why when I go into Romania with my dollars, my dollars are going four times as much as here. Okay. So if I have with me $2,000 or $2,500, it's as if I have $10,000 here to spend. So everything is very, very cheap. All right. Uh, at this point, I think I am done with uh the material on chapter two uh what i haven't talked about is what you it's not going to be covered at least in chapter two there are two things that the book the textbook covers but i'm not going to cover uh, and one of them is the difference between comparative advantage and absolute advantage and we're going to get to that when we get to chapter 33, or we get to get to trade. When we talk about international trade, that's when I'm going to bring up comparative advantage and absolute advantage. Not at this time. It's covering chapter two, but I'm going to cover it in different chapters. The other thing that I'm going to skip for now is this: the difference between relative prices, changes in relative prices, and changes in absolute prices. And the textbook makes a point of saying, which is true, that people care about changes in relative prices, not changes in absolute prices. And here's an example, folks. Let's say that uh, we're looking at two goods, hamburger meat and ribeye steak. And the price of a 
pound of hamburger is $3 a pound. And the price of a ribeye steak is $10 a pound. And now we change the price of hamburger and the price of ribeye steak. The price of hamburger goes up from $3 to $6. And the price of a ribeye steak goes up from $10 to $15. The question is, well, when the price goes up, sales will go down. The sales of which one of those two will go down more? Which one is gonna be more impacted by the price? And the answer is hamburger meat. How come? Because hamburger went up 100% in price. While ribeye steak went up only 50% in price. The price of ribeye steak went up $5 while the price of hamburger $3. But we don't care about those absolute changes in the prices, five versus three. We care about the relative change in price, 50% versus 100%. So that's, that's what they're talking about. But you're not going to see any questions on the test about relative and absolute uh, price changes. Okay, at this point, I think that I'm kind of done with the, the lecture. So please, please, please uh, ask any questions. I'm gonna stop the recording uh, unless you have a question. Yeah, if you have a question, uh, I'm gonna make you famous. Uh, oh no. Um, Kathy, you wanna be famous, okay. Oh. Uh, so, on the total amount of sales that drop on hamburger, is that more than the total amount of sales that drop on ribeye? Yeah, so I, I would expect that the sales of hamburger to go down more than the sales of ribeye, yeah. Uh, in dollar amounts, not percentage amounts? Oh, no, no, percentage-wise. Percentage. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, thanks. Yeah. That was uh -huh. the question. Professor, I know I noticed that this week was chapter two and chapter three is tomorrow. Yeah, it's gonna be just, just chapter two, uh, two. So I'm okay. gonna do th this week. I'm gonna do chapter two. Uh, next week, chapter three, and the week after that. Oh, next week I may do chapters three and four. I I still haven't decided. So because th chapters three and four are about supply and demand. Basically, in chapter three, they explain supply and demand. And then chapter four, uh, what happens uh, when there are changes in supply and changes in demand or changes in supply and demand at the same time? Okay. Okay, so let me stop the recording here.